Hi, and welcome to the uh, Machine Ethics Podcast. I have with me this week uh, Dr. Cosima Gretton. Um, hello. Hello. Hi, Ben. Um, nice to meet you. Um, great to be on the show. Um, Thanks very much. Could you just give us a little bit about your, your background, if that's okay? Sure. So I, uh, prior to medicine, um, studied psychology, and my background basically lies within the design of um, new technologies in healthcare. So I'm particularly interested in the interface between um, machines and technology and the way humans behave. And that pertains to whether it's just a simple app for people kind of helping behavior change and helping patients and people adhere to medicines to whether it's um, introducing new forms of intelligent algorithm or decision support into how doctors work and how that changes their behavior. Um, so that's my my general background and I, I write for the King's Fund on technology and I'm currently um, product managing a um, a, uh, a, a new kind of way of measuring patient reported outcomes. We're hoping to apply mm. uh, a form of machine learning to that. That's um, yeah, that's amazing. And you also studied at the um, Singularity University. Uh, yes, I did. Um, it's uh, yeah, it is a three month program in the summer mm. um, in in Mountain View in Silicon Valley. Um, it's a funny place. It's it's amazing. It's not really a university, and it's not about the singularity, mm. um, <laughs> despite the name. Um, but it's a kind of high speed, high intensity, three month introduction to all of the emerging technologies um, that are coming out of um, the US, but also lots of other places in the world at the moment. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of feel like the people who will be listening to this will probably be familiar with the singularity where we all merge with uh, robots and things hmm. like that. So um, yeah. not yeah. necessarily to do with that sort of um, outcome, but to do with yeah, um, new, fast emerging tech and interesting ways it could be um, used right yeah exactly yeah. exactly and and particularly the the application of emerging technology to um problems that are you know social problems essentially creating social impact rather than you know using these technologies to make more money or create mm. a new uh, chat messaging app so yeah it's quite quite it was quite a, a exciting place to go yeah i mean i i remember i think i might have mentioned this before but there was a great quote by a facebook um developer who said the greatest minds of our generation are working to make people click on more ads yeah um, so it's good that we have these institutions which are not necessarily yeah. about clicking on ads in that way that, that's a very interesting quote i i, I read that on the other day it's quite um uh ginsburg-esque as well isn't it um which which would make sense coming out of uh, san francisco and all of that yeah it makes yeah. sense definitely would agree yeah very sobering um so i usually just ask people what they're kind of um what they think about when they hear the term artificial intelligence or ai uh, there's it's a word that gets used a lot to do with lots of different things and things which aren't necessarily intelligent or clever or interesting uh, and some things mm. which uh, are very specific and you know very high tech or whatever it is um so i was just wondering when when um, I say the word or when people talk to you about artificial intelligence, what does it conjure up in your mind? Mm. I think I think for me what it conjures up is our own incessant moving of the goalposts. So um, whenever we create something that mm. achieves what we originally defined as artificial intelligence, we then decide that it's not artificial intelligence anymore. So if you look back in the history of, of AIs, it's kind of, you know, it had there was there has been very um, undulating in terms of hype, and then complete kind of periods mm. where where the AI winter, where people would kind of you know give up on give up on the the goal. But I think what's interesting throughout that is that whenever we create um, an algorithm that can achieve a particular thing that we once considered AI, then we decide that after that, that actually it's not necessarily proper artificial intelligence. It's, yeah. it's only another form of computation so i think so that's what what i think is quite interesting is that the definition tends to change and move depending on what the next challenge is um i think the thing that it tends to conjure up for the mo moment is you know the emergence and the prol proliferation of, of machine learning techniques um and the success of neural nets that hasn't really it, it, you know it's an approach that's that's old Mm. Um, but it's really only been in recent years that we've had um, the computational power and the amount of data um, 
to actually achieve it because one of the things about neural nets is you need vast amounts of data to train it on. So I think that's what I tend to think about at the moment uh, is that particular approach because it's uh, much more flexible than some of the previous approaches that were considered AI. Um, and then I think of Nick Bostrom and the kind of artificial superintelligence um, fear, um, yeah. Yeah. you know, that I'm sure people will be familiar with. Yeah, we talked a bit, yeah. a, a little bit um, uh, about that with uh, Callum Chase on our last episode, um, differing singularities and super intelligence and, and things like that, um, which I think is a interesting um, and not necessarily far fetched idea, but a uh, one I'm not necessarily worried about myself. But I don't know if you have any distinct opinions on that sort of AI and the uprising, almost. So um, I think it's something that, yes, m- most, of, m- most of the days um, I'm not particularly worried about. I'm more worried about what I'm going to have for dinner, as Nick Bostrom sure. says. You know, most people are worried about whether they're going to have chicken for tea or rather than actually concerning themselves about the AI uprising. And because, yeah, fundamentally it is so um, far beyond what we can conceive of currently. Um, and also, you know, it is not an imminent issue. There are many more imminent issues you see in healthcare day to day that involve you know, basic tech, let alone AI, let alone super intelligence. So it isn't something I worry about most of the time. I think about things a bit more immediate to hand. However, um, I mean, I've read the book and I do, to a certain extent, um, you know, share those fears. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that I, there is one aspect to Nick Bostrom's argument that I am not sure I fully agree with, Um and one of the arguments is that the superintelligence, so, so obviously the, the concept is that you have um, an artificial intelligence that's very narrow in its particular um, goal. So you, intelligence, it can be orthogonal to goals. So you've got this superintelligence or general intelligence um, and, and basically has one particular goal, which is obviously to, you know, in his example, create um, little handwritten notes via a robotic arm uh, to send to... Uh, customers and mm. um, in the iteration of that particular um, AI, the company connects it to the internet and it 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 learns um, from uh, text from the internet uh, how to improve its its messages. Um, and its one goal is just to create as many of these messages as possible using pencil and paper. And over time, um, it, uh, it it becomes better and better, and then it, and it develops super intelligence essentially. Um, and at one point, um, it, it, Bostrom argues that it realizes that um, to achieve its ultimate goal of filling the world with these notes, um, one of the main things stopping it will be humans that will um, turn it off. You know, mm. And at this point, it learns to deceive um, and it learns to trick the humans. Um, I think, oh, I can't remember exactly what it does at this point, but it learns to trick the humans. And I think fundamentally i'm not sure i uh understand the logic by where a algorithm yeah. no matter how intelligent it is could develop what is fundamentally theory of mind mm. because in order to deceive someone you need to understand the sense of self and other and that's not necessarily uh, the extent to which that is a kind of intelligence is, is a little unclear yeah. and I'm not sure I necessarily believe that just because something is super intelligent that it necessarily has a sense of self and a sense of other and a sense that someone might not know something that it knows mm. so I think I I'm not sure about this concept of deception at that point um, but it's obviously something I'd, I'd be good to have a chat with him about I guess yeah <laughs> I mean in, in his example with the paperclip it just it gets to the point where it like you've just pointed out um it's got this goal and it's going to do anything within its means to meet that goal being most efficient in any way possible until um maybe the humans get wiped out because to get to that goal it has to do something um which causes us to die but it makes more paper clips whatever um i think what you just pointed out with the um deception it is is more interesting because it's about um it's about something in which we don't we're quite unclear ourselves as human beings how the brain um has this thing that we call consciousness and we yes. can see you know in neuroscience um, we can see how 
the brain fires and we can uh, measure the makeup of chemical reactions in the brain and you know all these sorts of things but they don't necessarily tell us how a consciousness then exists or a set of um, algorithms if you like exist to make something um, you know into human beings into some sort of entity so it's I think it's quite a leap between that kind of efficiency um, yeah computational I mean, model to something which is yeah like you say like deceiving deception. And, um, I guess it it depends whether or not fundamentally you can have um, a theory of mind mm. without conscious awareness because I don't I don't think Rostrum is suggesting that this particular algorithm would be conscious yeah but it would need some form of the ability to understand that it might know something that someone else doesn't um it, you know the famous experiments um with children with autism and, and children up to a certain age is that if you this concept of the theory of mind if you present um a child with um before a certain age i think it's age mm. about four i can't yeah. remember exactly the details um with a smarties packet um and, uh, you, you know, essentially they won't, um, I can't remember, you, you ask them to put the pencil inside it and then show it to someone else. Um, they don't understand that the other person doesn't know that there's a pencil in there. Sure. They, don't, they don't understand the other person doesn't know what they know. And so that's a, I don't know to what extent that's a, uh, a function of intelligence and I, I, or of consciousness, but it's certainly a, a piece that needs to be addressed in that yeah. argument, I think. There's another experiment which is uh, very similar, which is um, one they do with animals, which is just putting a, a smidge of something on their nose and then yeah. presenting them with a mirror. And then they, either, if they don't have any sense of self, then they attack the mirror or try and pad the mirror instead of actually yeah. using their hand to take whatever's off their nose themselves, knowing that that's a reflection of themselves. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is interesting as well. Which is also yeah. something that happens with children, I think, but much earlier age. Just that age, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's an interesting aspect. But um, certainly, um, certainly, I think there is a risk with with what we're developing um, mm. that uh, you know there could be negative implications. And and one of his most compelling arguments for it, I think, is that it's so ubiquitous that you you know anyone could with the right kind of you know, skills and, and data and computational abilities, create their own um, AI. Sure. Uh, and that's one of the dangers of it is that it's incredibly impossible to regulate. Yeah. So I've got this um, I've got this algorithm on me now, and I'm just going to hit go on it and uh, see what happens. And um, fingers crossed, we'll create an AI. It's just, it's easy. It's like that. Yeah. No, no problem. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. Exactly. Um, um, so... Yeah, we'll see. But in the meantime, um, <laughs> there's some very interesting things that can be done, I think, in, in, in particular domains with yeah. even the most simple forms of AI um, at the moment. So, yeah. I mean, that that's brilliant because um, you did a TED Talk, uh, which is available on your website, uh, cosmogretton.co.uk, um, and there's a talk that you put together, which was uh, mainly kind of talking about how exciting technology is to do with healthcare and how it could help and um, kind of positive things about the future and how these things can make certain things much better. Uh, is there some things that I, you're seeing at the moment which not necessarily AI necessarily, but like things which are exciting to do with um, technology in, in medicine, which you can... Uh... Interesting question because I tend to span... Kind of both extremes. So um, I work day to day in the hospital where a lot of the exciting solutions are not really that exciting. They're just basics that um, really just need to get need to be um, got right. Um, but then the other end of the spectrum, um, see a lot of really exciting innovations that are much more about transforming, completely transforming the way healthcare works today. So. Um, I guess I can start, I'll start with what I see day to day. So I've just, I've just come sure. off a week of emergency surgery on calls and a lot of the solutions and technology that are needed at the moment are just really basic uh, communication and communication task organization and basically um, the integration of different bits of software. And one of the problems is, is that um, in trying to, there's plenty of great solutions out there for this. Yep. Um, it's not a difficult problem 
um, from a technology perspective. It's more about the politics around the procurement of solutions and the fact that um, none of these bits of software are integrated. So the hospital I work in at the moment uh, has 19 different software programs throughout the whole hospital, none of which communicate. Mm. So, of course, when presented with a new solution for to help doctors communicate or to task manage or to prioritize the hospital is not interested because they've got too many already and you know none of the doctors want to be logging into another bit of software the other um so the problem that you know i see day to day is just is just the fact that everything is cripplingly slow um because of poor lines of communication um and and poor technology um there's some interesting stuff coming out from um came out recently from DeepMind, uh google DeepMind, who have been um working with imperial um hospital uh, imperial college and and various different hospitals under that under them um with a, an app called hark um and basically hark is uh, a way of a way of prioritizing tasks and communicating between the doctors and the nurses and um and it's it's fantastic because at the moment you know if, if someone's sick um it takes the nurse a while to work it out because their observations are often on paper um if and then eventually the nurse works out that they're unwell has to work out which doctor to call it spends about 20 minutes trying to bleep them the doctor's busy and can't answer the bleep sure. eventually the doctor answers it it's the wrong doctor they're prioritizing about 40 different tasks, you know, and then they've got to come to another part of the hospital. Everything just takes so long. And um, so Hark is doing, you know, it's done a great job already of trying to make that process better. Yeah. What Google DeepMind are doing is they're being they're able to put the full force of a large, uh, you know, organization with a lot of money and a lot of resources behind the transformation process to bring that in. Because in hospitals, um, the problem is that, yeah, it's about, the transformation that needs to occur rather than necessarily the tech. Um, mm-hmm. So that's, that's one side of things. Um, uh, you know, it's like living and working in the dark ages at the moment, at least, <laughs> at least where I work. The other side of things is the kind of more exciting, um, you know, totally transformative ways of, of looking at healthcare. And I think those don't come from hospital medicine um, because I think hospital medicine is, is an old and outdated mode of practice. Um, I think there'll be, um, you know, different different ways of looking at things. I think um, some of the more exciting approaches for me are um, using predictive analytics to try to um, prevent people from being readmitted into hospital. Um, and uh, that's really interesting because that's, you know, when we start to get Google DeepMind is trying to use um, predictive analytics as well as, uh, yeah. to, to work out when people are going to get ac- acute kidney injury from their um you know, hospital records and their blood results and things like that and try to intervene early. And I think that's a really interesting, um, exciting new approach for medicine. It's a difficult one because healthcare has, you know, everything about medicine is reactive, not just the way we do it, but the way doctors are trained is about reactive medicine. We're trained to basically ask, you know, sets of questions yeah. that, uh, you know, form a kind of decision tree that identify problems that can be solved. Um, the, the interventions are reactive. We treat when there are problems, acute problems. We don't, it, it's very, it's a whole new field um, of, of predictive medicine where we don't know, you know, doctors don't necessarily know what to do if you were to tell someone, if you were to tell a doctor, this patient's going to get sick in three days' time, you need to intervene now. We don't know what to do. We don't know what to ask the patient. We don't know, you know, there's no evidence as to what kind of treatments would actually work at that stage so there's a really we may have the technology that can predict um you know disease in advance we don't necessarily have the rest of the system to accompany that which is the training and the education of the doctors and the evidence base on which to base their interventions so that's a really interesting future i think for for redefining the whole of medicine from the, the point of view of that new tech um, yeah. yeah, so that that's one thing that I'm, I'm particularly excited about at the moment. Yeah, I, I mean, all that stuff is fantastic, and I think the um, it's a very good way of looking at it to kind of flip it on its head and go, you know, we're going to prevent um, symptoms rather than treat them, or you know, yeah. or, or manage a bit of both. Um, maybe using um, you know IoT technology with statistical analysis maybe machine learning with and integrating that in i think all that sort of stuff would be um 
fantastically useful. Do you think that there's much thinking that you've seen behind the kind of ethical implications of almost deferring some of the judgment to an algorithm or some sort of system? Um, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of hoops that you have to go through in, in healthcare, and I was wondering if there's those sorts of um, hoops are um, the bars are set too high, maybe for this technology to to get adopted at all, maybe um, because mm. there might be statistical anomalies or um, false uh, positives, um, some you know things which may not be such a big issue when it comes down to my Siri app, my you yeah. know wake me up at the right time app which is driven by machine learning or whatever it is but it might if i have a heart condition or or something a bit more serious um so the you know so is there something like that you that you've seen or um... yeah definitely i mean you know and 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 i don't think i think that we have to take that into account very seriously um Mm. i don't think i think that the medical profession is very slow to change um, and, and that is a criticism of them. But I think also there is good reason for that because it is very, very different. It's a very different context. So um, there's an interesting anecdote someone uh, gave the other day, which was of a, gen- of a gentleman who was admitted to A&E um, and had a, a cardiac arrest and um, admitted to A&E and, you know, treated, but unfortunately he died. Right. And his family, uh, he was wearing an Apple Watch, I think it was, or a Fitbit, or so, I can't remember which mm. device. And his family obtained the data on that. And the data showed that his heart had stopped six hours before the doctors said it had. And the family were trying to use that to claim that he hadn't been treated properly, which the problem is, is that the you know, the data from these devices is not reliable um, yeah. at all. There's um, a digital health consultant called Manish uh, Gineja who's who's been wearing, you know, all of them at once. And he's found massive discrepancies between what they actually show. Um, and so the real world implications of this data are, you know, are serious. Um, and I think that we need to, to, to take it into account. And, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily think the regulations are, I think it's very difficult to get technologies into healthcare, but I don't necessarily think that's because of the actual safety regulations. I think often yeah. that's because of the organisational change that has to go about and and how you have to basically compete with incumbents on 10-year legacy contracts and all those kind of things. There, there are many other reasons, not just the regulatory reasons. Um, yeah, so I think, I think that's one aspect. I think that your question about... The ethics of decision making um, using algorithms is a very um, important point. And um, at the moment, the general approach is to say, well, it'll be a hybrid approach. So the decisions are made, um, you know, by clinicians, but by the algorithm with, with clinician oversight. Yep. Um, and I think that's a really good way to start. I think that the problem with that is that a lot of clinicians don't have a full understanding of um, the basis on which the technology is making the decision or necessarily sure. have the right threshold for doubting the decision um, of the technology. So um, there needs to be a lot more education in tra- and training with, with, with doctors to help them understand the threshold for believing what the machine is telling them to do. Because often if you place too much trust in what that, what, you know, the decision support algorithm is, is telling you, you can, um, you know, engage in areas of commission where you do things because just because it said, yep. um, and equally areas of omission where you don't do things just because it is just because it said. Um, and, you know, I see those kind of examples happening already with basic bits of tech, um, yep. in, in hospitals at the moment, let alone anything intelligent, um, I think it's uh, it's one of those um, strange psychological tricks as well. When you um, if you give um, up a certain amount of autonomy, uh, and this is there's a, a test that they did with um, autonomous cars. So you're being driven in a car, and you're being told that you know you have to look at the road and you have to um, uh, even though you're not driving, you have to be ready to take control of the vehicle. And because they're not actually these people aren't actually driving their response time lowers like vastly um yeah <laughs> just because because they know then that they don't necessarily need to do anything yeah um the threshold lowers down so they start doing things like 
playing with their phone, reading, um, talking with other people in the vehicle. Um, and, it, it, you know, you could have a, a similar kind of reaction when, you know, you're just taking the system for granted or because, you know, oh, well, most of the time it works, so it must yeah. be right or whatever. Exactly. It, it definitely does lower your your, your threshold for for you know, engaging and being concerned. And actually, um, it's not only about lowering your threshold in the moment, but also, um, as well, you know, people talk about the de-skilling and mm. I think it is a real, I think it is a real threat because, um, you know, for example, that the, the Air France crash, um, one of the investigations found that one of the problems was, was, was that the pilots just had a lack of experience from flying because of an over-reliance on the autopilot so that when the autopilot right. failed, they they were unable to um, perform as, as necessary and yeah. um, you know I, I think that's um, certainly true um, and and is something that we have to think about um, we we'll have to think about it in in the future because we're going to also be asking it's also going to be difficult to train doctors in the future if we've got if we have algorithms that can perform most of the diagnoses mm. or assist in the diagnoses. The motivation of doctors to spend six years learning things, learning infinite amount of information that an algorithm can do within 30 seconds is going to yeah. be, you know, somewhat yeah. under question. <laughs> um, <laughs> sure. So, you know, not only are you going to have people who don't practice as often, who don't use those abilities as often, but also who don't necessarily see the point. Mm. It's, it's like, you know, how many people are going to learn to drive um, when we have autonomous cars? Well, yeah. would you go through that extra effort? when it's not necessarily needed. So there's going to be lots of different um, implications, I think, I think it, for it. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a very good point because there's there's this flip of the coin, isn't there, where these, you know, di diagnostic machines or algorithms might be able to um, be really hugely useful for um, countries like India and Africa and, and places where there are... Um, swathes of land where it's difficult to get to medical professions yeah. professionals so you could have um, some sort of uh, network of you know loosely trained people with access to these sorts of yeah. Um, yeah. algorithms and stuff to treat people um, yeah it's kind of a double-edged sword in that way definitely definitely I mean so, so that, that exactly the other benefit is that you get you know having um artificial intelligence algorithms that are able to perform some of these these functions um, definitely upskills every single person along the chain of healthcare. So mm. it would upskill the patient to be able to self-diagnose. There's some already out there that are attempting to do that, like your MD in Babylon. Then, you, you know, you'd be able to upskill um, basic community health workers with computer vision so they can, ha they can do eye exams. There's a company called Peak. Another company I used to work for called Skin Analytics, um, who does skin um, examinations, you know, for, for, for skin cancer. Right. Um, you have all sorts of things that can help upskill people on the ground who don't necessarily have that ability. And I think that's a really important new direction for healthcare that we're seeing, which is parceling out and um, taking away from the domain of the doctor some of the basic tasks. Um, you know, um, there's lots of endeavors um, throughout emerging markets to try to make things like cataract operations done by basically, you know, um, community health workers, just to be, simple things that actually don't need to have someone who's highly trained within the whole of medicine to do. I think technology can really help with that. And then at the same time, it then upskills the next people up the chain, which might be the doctors, just the general doctors like myself in, in, in a general hospital in London, yeah. who then can access more specialist information. Um, and then beyond that, um, you know, if you're a specialist oncologist, you might be potentially um, using Watson to, you know, identify what the latest um, research shows and Watson can help you scan all of the available literature in the world that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. So um, it's a double edged sword. Exactly. Is that, yeah. you know, on the one hand, you de-skill, but on the other hand, you can upskill in terms of what you what you can obtain and access. Um, and I think actually. It will more. It'll just redefine what we do as doctors because now we spend so much energy and time in learning, um, you know, these mm. basics. Yep. Um, and if those, if that burden is removed, then there will be more energy and time to, you know, engage with patients, uh, carry out research, improve the services in which you work. Like, you know, if, uh, that would be. I, I can see just on a personal level. Um, 
you know, the amount of work I do that doesn't need to be done, that could be done better by a machine. And that would free me up with time to actually, you know, work on improving the system even further. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, so I think one of the really fundamental things that underpins all of this, though, is the incentives that underlie healthcare. And I think that will make a big impact on what's on the uptake of these technologies. Um, in that healthcare has historically been um, fee for service. So essentially, um, you know, we pay for things, uh, we pay for activities. So if you get a knee operation, um, hospitals paid by the number of knee operations they do per year. Whether or not those knee operations actually help that person, because a lot of people actually mm. have worse knee pain after a knee, uh, a knee replacement, um, is not accounted for in the payment structure in any way. And so what we're shifting towards is um, what's called value-based or, or outcomes-based payments, where we pay on performance, we pay on whether or not you've actually achieved a, a good outcome. Yep. And um, outcomes are essentially, there's kind of two main types. I mean, there's clinical outcomes. So, you know, have you actually managed to reduce someone's blood pressure? Um, have you, you know, have you managed to actually reduce their blood sugar? But also there are, um, more importantly, other kinds of outcomes that really aren't measured, which are often called patient reported outcomes, which are kind of psychological outcomes. Does that person feel healthy and able to actually go and live their life, which is fundamentally like the ultimate goal of healthcare. And yeah. we don't think about it enough. And so the reason why this is important is that at the moment, the incentives are not in place, um, to to adopt these new technologies because um we're still focused on just doing these activities and we pay for the activities and so if you bring in a new activity um you're not going to it's very hard to restructure that payment system if you pay for the outcome it doesn't matter what activity you do you can actually adopt a new technology to get to the outcome there's a really good analogy um i work for a company called outcomes based healthcare which is the um, company I'm developing this this um, product with, yep. and um, Rupert Dunbar Reese, who's the founder, one of the founders, he gives the analogy of um, the, a plumber. So if your boiler's broken, you call a plumber in, and you're paying him for the outcome, which is a warm house. You're not paying him for the the, the process, which is a particular type of boiler. Um, and so if he comes along and he says, I want to put in a totally new boiler, you're like a, a brand new type, you're, you're absolutely fine. Mm. My healthcare is at the moment is that you pay the plumber for the boiler and he can only come in and put in that particular boiler, right. which is completely mad. <laughs> so <clears throat> it means that if there's any new um, way of doing things, it's very hard to get it brought into the system. Right. So, um, yeah. That's really interesting. I've not, not really heard that um, kind of payment structure and how that yeah. affects... The kind of system itself, I guess. The uptake um, of technology, exactly. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, if that sort of thing can be changed, that's exciting. It's a bit like um, yeah. national it's... gross product when your na nation could be the most unhappy nation in the world. You know, um, even if they're the richest, it, 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 this is kind of marrying of yes, um, yes, exactly. So yeah. yeah, so so we are moving slowly towards that. Um, I think that you know the UK and the US have different approaches. The US has got um has had a lot of kind of publicity around it um informing these new accountable care organizations who are all oriented towards the outcomes of the patient um mm. in the uk we're doing it piece more piecemeal but it's it's definitely happening slowly so um i think that will be uh really important um yeah in terms of in terms of opening up um opportunities to bring in new solutions um, yeah. because the payment structure will be different yeah that sounds super exciting um fantastic um yeah sorry slightly off topic from from no here. no no it's no, really no, important because it's the fundamental you know reason why or why not these things will be adopted yeah, yeah. no i think um it's, it's hugely interesting um because it gives you a little bit of uh, understanding of more of a high level of why some things are, are the way they are i guess um, yeah in our nhs which we love and care about and want to keep <laughs> Yeah, um, yes, <laughs> we might need to pay good. More taxes, if we want to keep it. <laughs> sure, sure, more taxes. Um, um, yes, uh, let's not start that conversation. No, we won't go down that line. Um, um, yeah. Anyway, um, so we've got um, the medical profession. We've got these technologies uh, coming in. We've got these strange payment um, methodologies um, which need to change. Um, is there any? Um, I mean, I often feel. 
think about how ethics affects people and how autonomy can be used negatively and um and and who makes these decisions um it's quite an interesting one i mean who is making these decisions i guess in in the medical profession um at the moment uh, and do you think that's reasonable so Mm, mm. Um, you're, you're saying um, that you have these, you know, like Google or, or DeepMind weighing in in a certain um, projects. Um, is that a reasonable thing to yeah. um, leverage and, and therefore kind of have them and their ideologies embedded in the software? Um, I think I that's a very, very important point. Um, so it, we're shifting really, aren't we? Because, you know, medicine has traditionally been um, owned and operated by doctors yep. in that not only is the knowledge owned but also just the operations the daily organization of tasks like when when something happens uh, we work out a what to do and also what priority that takes and the millions of other things that need to be done yep. um, and who else to involve and you know that's been owned and operated by doctors we are shifting and, it, and it, I think it needs to be shifted towards healthcare that's owned and operated by software um, because we need to remove the burden of a lot of these tasks from doctors because there aren't enough doctors there aren't enough there's enough time and you know we just across the globe healthcare is struggling so right. the problem is is that there isn't software doesn't have an implicit ethical apart from the data security side isn't there isn't an implicit ethical code you know doctors are trained from from day one um under the hippocratic oath yep. and have a very strong very 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 strong ethical code um in, you know, embedded into them and and with software and um the development of ai and uh, all kinds of aspects but there isn't really that implicit in it and i don't think there is in the medical profession i don't think there are the right people with the right training to do this so we have clinical informatics doctors um, and we have, you know, IT departments. Yep. I think that the IT departments are traditional IT departments, I mean, um, and, and and the doctors in clinical informatics tend to be quite traditional doctors who are consultants who've, <clears throat> you know, become a consultant in a specific area of medicine, and then, you know, obtain this this other aspect as a, as a kind of addition. And so I think we really need to focus on creating a whole new breed of people maybe a specialism a clinical informatics make it make it proper specialism to have that understanding of both sides of the coin and the ethics and the and the thought processes that need to go into mm. um this this field because if health is going to be owned and operated by software we need to have the right people to to make that happen and i don't think doctors alone are and i don't think the tech companies alone are um we need something in the middle yeah yeah i mean the the is it the Hipp hippocratic oath mm, mm. yeah i think that's a really interesting point that the i mean you as a medical profession professional you almost have this underlying ideology which you get at day one whereas the rest of us we don't get taught that we don't get taught anything like that really um in in any of our education and one of the things i always thought would is you know there's lots of things that we could learn more about in school maybe paying your taxes would be a good one as well and, and i've being, always thought that being human, you know <laughs> you're always going to get a job so you might as well learn about paying tax and, i know it'd be and, really and boring writing to ask, cv it, and you know boring stuff like that but i think um the the ethics of kind of design design ethics almost um, yeah would be a good one as well I mean we're supposed to get some of that from religious education but I think um, in our kind of current context it might be worth broadening that kind of horizon out into um, you know DT and um, art and music and mm. and all those sorts of um, <clears throat> um, parts of education which I don't think that's have a really... to be about ethics, but can have an ethical part. Basically. Yeah, I yeah. think that's a really good point because, yeah, um, the design of technology is very important because you, yeah, it, well, design of anything is incredibly yeah. important. You can, you can, you know, change behaviours um, sure. with design and yeah. therefore you need to have a strong ethical code of what kind of behaviours you're trying to change. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, that, I mean, that's 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 apparent through lots of fields yeah i think there's a I, I can't remember quite correctly but there's a really good example of a company who had a fitbit type band which was about uh, tracking sleep patterns and waking you up at certain times and stuff 
Uh, and the company were able to do things uh, which are, are things that Facebook trial out sometimes, which are psychological tests to do with um, if all of our users get prompted to wake up uh, 20 minutes before they normally get woken up, how much does that affect those users? And they can do that without notifying anyone um, because they have the technology and they have it available within their user base. So you, wow. so you can quite easily affect people even if it's, um, you know, an internet-connected fridge or, um, you know, an That's answer on Siri. Um, and you can and very people, unethical, um, really, because yeah, you're, exactly. you're essentially, it's all very well, you know, manipulating me to click on a different link, but um, to actually interrupt someone's sleep yeah. without asking permission. These, these things are <laughs> yeah. not viruses. They're not Trojan horses. They're not worms. They're nothing that we know yeah. uh, that we try and protect our computers against. They're just things that actually that we use and that, um, you know, we pay for. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. it's interesting. How I, that it's a, that's a really interesting dilemma. And actually we've been coming up against it at outcomes based healthcare because mm. so, so the product we've uh, been developing is an attempt to digitally measure patient reported outcomes um, yep. using passively gathered smartphone sensor data. So instead of, um, you know, people answering these quest psychological questionnaires, we basically, um, we asked them to do it. We, we decided to do a research study and we basically asked the people to answer these questions every single day for a period of a month and in the background gather all the smartphone sensor data yep. and apply a machine learning technique um, called topological data analysis where you get basically cluster bits of data um, and to see if any of those clusters of data correlate with certain um, certain health outcomes on, on the questionnaire scales. Now, what we've come across with this is this interesting debate about ethics. So we've, as we're a healthcare company, mm -hmm. um, we're not, we're, um, although we're not, even though we're not actually working with NHS patients, we're still working with people with health conditions. We've applied for full ethics approval. Yep. Um, or we haven't yet, but we're going to apply for full ethics approval when we, we launch the trial and we've put together the application. And so, but we're very aware that what we're doing is absolutely no different to what a lot of other companies do anyway yeah. um, without applying for ethical approval. And there's this kind of um, funny, ba fuzzy boundary where if you're Facebook, you can do this kind of stuff without applying for ethical approval. But if you're a healthcare company, you kind of should. Um, and mm. so, you know, I, I think, I think that's, um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a really interesting um, dilemma and, you know, there's a lot of research in the same field coming out of academia and there they would have full ethical approval, but yet at the same time, there are technology companies in healthcare doing it. And I'm pretty sure they don't. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know what the solution is at the moment. Okay. Well, we'll, um, we'll chat about that and, and work it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've got a couple of minutes Sorry, later. That we'll just uh, make that happen. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I think that's um, that's time. If um, yeah, it, that's that's fantastic. Thanks very much um, for giving up your time and uh, your knowledge and experience uh, with uh, us, uh, myself, and the listeners. Um, it's been extremely interesting, and I I found the um, the payment structure stuff um, really fascinating. And um, just the kind of overarching pains of of the daily medical <laughs> profession is uh, one that you know I'm sure that most of us um, feel is there, but you know um, yeah. there can be some uh, low low lying low fruit. fruit. Low yes, fruit, exactly, definitely. exactly. There definitely are, um, yeah, lots of low hanging fruit. Yeah, yeah. No, cool. fantastic. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, and um, yeah, it's been a really interesting discussion. Great. Thanks very much. 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 
Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks very much. Great, thanks.